record and we'll see whenever it lets us know when we're ready. Not bad. This computer's slower. This computer's slower. So, all right, there we go. Recording started. So we're ready. Pause and then start talking whenever you're ready. Welcome back in, everybody. This is episode 14 of the Cougar Digest podcast. I am Rob Sellers, publisher of Cougar Digest. Joined, as always, by Kevin, digital dude. Uh, you took your little uh, your pronunciation guide down. You're going to confuse people again. <laughs> uh, also, this week, back by popular demand and also because his work schedule allowed for it. Gatlin is back in town and back on. Uh, what's up, both of you guys? How have y'all been? Hey Rob, uh, doing all right. Hope the uh, party was a hit yesterday, and you got ample opportunities mm. to embarrass your daughter on her uh, at her <laughs> birthday party. Yes, Tim <laughs> <Ford>. <laughs> How are you doing? Uh, I'm, I'm doing. All, I'm doing all right, guys. Um, you know, it's uh, it's uh, it's basketball season, right? Yeah, <laughs> that's right. That's right. That is We're right. Fully it kicked off good. That's. Uh, I think a lot of people are happy with that, especially everything that's been going on. Um, so episode 14, I don't know. I keep, I thought 13 was big last time, but yeah, I think we're getting there a little bit now, you know, kind of got a bit of steam built up. Uh, but I think, uh, for, first and foremost, before we get rolling, uh, I think it's appropriate to stop and talk for a second about the, uh, situation with the tragedy and the wreck from Saturday morning, uh, with the former Cougar players. Uh, it's something that we've talked about a little bit. I, I, I mentioned a few things just briefly in the thoughts from the morning after this morning. Uh, something's been on my mind a lot, obviously, since since the news started coming out and breaking. Uh, one of those gut punch moments in life, so to speak, when I read it, it's just names I wouldn't expect to see in that situation. and right. A little too close to home for me personally. Uh, but uh, obviously, uh, DJ Hayden is a guy that, that I've known for quite a while, uh, started covering him when he was at Navarro and Houston was recruiting him. He and Chevy Bennett were teammates at Navarro and started covering them and went to a Navarro blend game that year and saw them play, talked with them a lot. And they also came in that summer to visit campus. And, you know, I had a pretty good relationship with them through the recruiting process. Then obviously covered DJ when he was here and, and through the crazy stuff that happened while he was here, obviously that was, a huge life moment as it was, as it seems now, it seems unfair. But uh, when he went through the process of, of of when he nearly died on the practice field and all that, that was one of those things that, that happened. Uh, kept up with him, too, when he left uh, for the NFL. Ran into him a few times throughout the years when he was in the league. Uh, when he would come back, I would see him and stuff. And then, again, within probably in the last year or so, kind of reconnected a bit with him. Me and him were working some, actually – uh before this podcast came to kind of be and got going we we were uh, in talks uh me and him about a just a uh, audio only podcast on one of these podcast networks and uh it came close to to coming to be and then things just didn't really kind of get off the ground at the end and, and then uh this this one came to kind of get started and i think he was kind of getting involved more in the coaching stuff so um he was going to be, as as Kevin knows, he was going to be on the show a couple times earlier. We had prepared for him to be on. We just never could get it worked out uh, yeah, timing-wise yeah. with him and all that. Kept missing him, and that kind of – that hurts a little bit after the fact. You know, I kind of wish we would have had a chance just to get him on there and, you know, have some fun and cut up a bit just to have for, for now. Yeah. But uh, hadn't talked to him in, in a few weeks. I texted him a couple weeks ago just, hey, man, hadn't heard from you and hope everything's going good with you. Let me know. Well, you're all right type thing. Usually I see him at the game or something. I'll run into him somewhere along the way, but I hadn't seen him. And as it turns out, uh, uh, he was doing some coaching and all that at Second Baptist, as we found out. I, I found out after the fact. So uh, he, he's probably the one that, that I knew the most of the group. Uh, obviously, Zach McMillan is another kid. Just, it just, I keep saying kid, and I apologize for that. I'm getting old, but uh, I got to know these, these players when they were kids. You know, I met Zach when he was in high school still before his senior year. Uh, obviously learned about his connections with his dad and the Cougar history there. Uh, covered Zach at Dulles. And uh, I know I've got some really good photos and videos and whatnot. I'm, I'm, I'm going to sit down later this evening and go back and kind of uh, put some photos together just for something to, you know what I mean, to put out just to have and, and stuff like that. But Zach was, man, just a great kid, small body. He was always undersized, but, man, he had a great corner cornerback mentality. Very 
I mean, he was one of those guys that was was small, but he wasn't afraid to throw. He had a lot of shoulder injuries because of it, but uh, he wasn't afraid to put his nose in there and run support and all that. And he kind of uh, almost relished it a little bit. A lot of people would would under uh, undervalue his his tackling ability, but uh, I was impressed as despite what it did to his body, he was one of those who would constantly put his nose in there. And, and it, it, you know, like I said, he had some injuries. He fought with shoulders and stuff like that because of that, but. Really good kid. I, I last I saw him was uh, just a few years ago. He had come back for a game. I think he was still in the area and all that, but I ran into him at a game and yeah, he was in a suit. He had come after work and I was just like, man, you know, you look all you look like a grown up. You know what I mean? We we laughed and he just had such an infectious smile and, and a great attitude. Just a really good kid, man. It's just it stinks. It stinks that this happened the way it did. And Ralph uh, Ralph Uragu was uh, the other one that passed. Um, I didn't know until I saw Tony Levine's tweet, but he had reconnected with Tony Levine and was working with him in some capacity at Chick Fil A. So um, it's one of those things, you know. The, these families and these players and these coaches they get to know each other so well, and they become families. And it's not surprising that a group like that would be hanging out. Uh, Jeffrey Lewis, the other guy that was also in the vehicle that did not pass away, uh, and that is uh, still in the hospital last I saw. But uh, again, Jeffrey Lewis came in about the same time. I covered him and uh, Broderick Thomas Jr. Both were at Houston Madison that year, and Houston had recruited them uh, both together. And so uh, I didn't have a gr- necessarily a real close relationship. I, you know, I saw him in high school, and, and he never was a star at Houston, just – he was a real good athlete, though. I know he played running back and defensive back at different times. And so, you know, he's one of those guys that could kind of go either way, just a real good football player. But, uh, man, just tough news to wake up to. And, and, and you know, I, I don't even know what the status was with Zach in, in terms of his fa- family, if he was married or not or had kids. I know DJ's married and has kids, uh, and they're still young. So, uh, you know, though, if, if you lie yourself, or, I mean, there's 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 so much, so many, many more layers to all this in terms of what, uh, just how far it reaches in terms of their families. Uh, I mean, obviously, the, these people are so young; their parents are around still, and that, you know, it's just tough on a family in general to go through. But um, I don't know, man. It's tough. You you feel like as you get older. Uh, things try, you would think they would hit you less at times just because life's experiences, you know, you, you deal with more with death as you get older and all that. But man, reading that just really, really hit me in the gut the other day and just st- kind of stopped me in my tracks. I, I saw it and uh, pulled it up. And as I'm like, literally it's just frozen, almost reading the names off the, off the Twitter. And uh, I was just, I don't know, just standing there. I couldn't, I couldn't wrap my brain around it. And still, I don't know, if I really stopped to think about it a whole lot, but man, uh, really tough situation. And you could, you could tell everybody I ran into, uh, I texted with Joey some, uh, as it was unfolding, I was texting Joey and he was pretty, you know, he seemed like he was pretty shook up as well. This was a long time frame when he was involved there. So this, this would have been teammates. Uh, just everybody too, you see on the sideline, normal people you say hi to, you know, High and whatever, and you know, kind of heavy heart. You could tell, and then the football game didn't help any after the fact. But we'll save that for later. Uh, I don't know, man. It's one of those things. I try to learn something from it a bit, so to speak. You know, I don't want to be the old uh, philosophy guy or nothing like that. But you know, I'm I'm appreciative, I guess, in the time and the relationships I got with them. Uh, but it's one of those things. You you wish it didn't have to come down to that, and it sucks that it has to be because of drinking and driving and all this situation. This is just, I mean, crazy. Why? You know what I mean? Why? Why? Yeah. There's a million reasons why people shouldn't do it. And it still happens. It's going to happen tomorrow and the next, you know, it's going to keep happening, but man, just to be, uh, just to be that young out hanging out with your friends, out probably having a good time. Clearly, you know, they didn't say anything about them and alcohol and be involved when they're in, but, uh, so clearly, I would assume whoever's driving or whatever, it's it's not the important part to be honest with you. But uh, to be minding your own business, sitting there, and someone runs a red light and just completely ends ends three full lives with families, and you know Jeffrey Lewis is going to have to recover from all this as well. So, <coughs> excuse me. Right, right. But yeah, um, crazy times, man. Just to piggyback off of that, Rob, you know, it, it, it does just make you kind of pause and just remember that we're mortal and 
life is short and take it every take advantage of every day that you have right and uh, obviously, it's a tragedy that hits really close to home because these were three Houston guys, right? Dulles, Marshall, and Elkins, I believe, is the high schools that they were yeah. from. So these were Houston guys through and through, you know, spent their college careers for the most part at the University of Houston, at least McMillan and uh, Aragu, all four years. Uh, and, um, you know, DJ came back after two years at Navarro and finished out, uh, I think, his junior year. He was second team all conference his senior year. He was first team all conference despite only playing nine games because the uh, accident happened at practice after the ninth game. He didn't make it to the 10th, but, um, you know, still recovered in time to, um, you know, get in some workouts before the draft and was drafted 12th overall by Oakland. You know, talk about a miracle, right? Just, just, you know, living from that accident where 95% of the people die from it. Um, but luckily they the have irony of the trainers and medical staff. And car exactly. You know, and just, just, you know, puts in perspective just, you know, how much, um, you know, uh, uh, effort and force is being put out there on the football field, you know, just even just in a practice, but definitely hits close to home, you know, these three uh, being three Houston guys and not just, you know, not just the, uh, you know, uh, Zach and, and DJ and Ralph, but, you know, the other people that were involved in the in the accident and also, you know, you got right. several families who are dealing with this and it's, it's just sad all around and, uh, you know, like you said, unexpected, you know, but, uh, you know, things happen. And just uh, take each day as, um, you know, a, a chance to do something, do something good in this, in, in this world while you're, while you're here. But definitely was, thoughts and prayers to big, go out to the family. Yeah. Such a big moment yeah. too, just to, that you reminded me of when he, when he got back healthy after, I mean, literally just about dying uh, and trying to recover. <laughs> and I remember he specifically wanted to go out there and, and, and do his workout and run his 40 without a shirt. You know, he did it on purpose because he wanted that scar, that yeah, scar from scar. his neck all the yeah. way to his belly button. I mean, that was kind of a badge of honor, so to speak, for him that he had to fight through. And he was proud of what he had done to get through it. So uh, I think yeah. he saw it as a blessing. Uh, I know he had a, you know, in, in my experience around him, he seemed like he had a, uh, a fair relationship in his faith, so to speak. And, and uh, yeah, it's just crazy to see <laughs> to see him overcome something like that and to still be as successful as he was. And then for some, I mean, it just, yeah, it's still, it, it doesn't make sense. And, and you drive yourself crazy trying to make sense of it. So it's one of those deals I probably won't dwell on too, too long just because, like I said, I'm never going to unsort it in my head. It's never going to find, find a way to make sense. So yeah, move, you know, take your time with it type thing and then and move forward. Yeah. So, all right. Uh, uh but yeah, like you said, a lot of thoughts and prayers. I do appreciate you pointing that out. My, my prayers, obviously, with the, all those families, uh, everybody affected, just like you said. And, and hopefully, uh, I'm sure I'll see some of these people soon uh, in the next few days. But uh, hopefully, everybody can uh, maybe you never know. Maybe this will be uh, something that, that's good in someone's life, and move, they move forward off of it. So, yeah. hope, hope there's some sort of positive that comes out of it for a life lesson or something from somebody. I agree. I agree. All right. Uh, with that, Gatlin, you got anything you want to add or um, any thoughts? Um, no, I mean, I, I think you guys have, have kind of uh, said it, but, you know, just uh, certainly prayers to, to all those families affected. I, I lost my dad two years ago unexpectedly. And uh, wow. so did I. I, I, yeah. know, I, I know kind of personally what it can feel like to just have that ripped away, you know, uh, so can't imagine, uh, what those families are going through. And, and, you know, the, the most heartbreaking part is, you know, you're right, Rob, like for, for all of us, we will mourn for a day, maybe a week, you know, and our lives will go back to normal, but for, yeah. uh, you know, six families, um, life will never be the same again. And, yeah. uh, yeah, and that's really and holidays cool. are coming. That makes it worse. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so, um, you know, prayers, prayers to all those affected and uh, it's gone too soon, man. Yeah. Yeah. Here all right. Go. Well, let's uh, let, let's segue into uh, yesterday's basketball game against AM Corpus Christi uh, at, at Fertitta uh, Tillman Center. So, um, Rob Gatlin. Y'all always uh, got a chance to watch the game, or Rob, were you too busy partying out? Yeah, with, uh... I actually, yeah, I was partying hard with the thirteen-year-olds. So yeah. 
I did not actually go back. I watched as it played out some. I had it open on my phone, but I was trying to be nice and not, you know what I mean? I, I was there for a reason. So I, I just peeked at it every now and then. Uh, shortly after the food got there, they kind of went to do their own thing and be silly and giggle and stuff. So I didn't, you know what I mean? I wasn't directly in the middle of it as much, but uh, I went back and scooped over some highlights and this and that, but and went back and read the box score and all that. But I have not actually watched the game, so I'll probably do that later this evening, just because I want to see a little bit more per se from like uh, the younger guys that got in, JoJo Tugler and guys like that. I want to actually see them a little bit. Yeah, I uh, I was able to to catch the game. Um, you know, Kevin, you and I were talking a little bit about this uh, before the show, but uh, you know, kind of a. A, a tale of two halves, certainly, and you know some some highs and and things that you see that you really like, but you know definitely uh, you know some things that concern you. You know, I think this is definitely probably one of the worst uh, perimeter defending Kelvin Sampson Houston teams that we've seen, and you know not to say that it can't get better, but you just look at some of those guys, and I just don't know that they have the athletic ability on the perimeter that we've seen historically you trade that in for some offense with guys like you know Damian Dunn and LJ Cryer and even you know Ramon Walker seeing a little bit more involved uh who you know don't get me wrong he'll hustle on defense but he just doesn't have the kind of speed and length to to guard on the perimeter the way you know some of those guys in his role historically have so um definitely some some concerns and some things I saw that I liked for sure Talking about more yeah. like on closeouts and stuff like that in terms of guys being able to close those uh, out. Um, well, the, the closeouts, not the getting closeouts past the, drives. Yeah, getting passed out on drives. Like, you know, you saw it a lot in the first half with uh, LJ Cryer, you know, just kind of getting beat by. And now the one thing I did see from him that I that I liked was a willingness to defend. Yeah, um, which when is, you did get beat, yeah, yeah. He's been working he did, on it. Yeah. He wasn't giving up and just kind of letting the guy get to the rim. He chased, he would rotate over on the on the big men and try to, you know, contest down low when, when they got the entry pass down in there and stuff. So, you know, I, I saw effort from him, which is great. Um, you know, he certainly wants, he has the want to. Um, but again, I just don't know that he has that lateral quickness to be Marcus Sasser, right? I mean, that's, you saw a bunch of the national guys have said, you know, oh, they need to replace Marcus Sasser and LJ Cryer's that. And it's like, this especially on the defensive end, he's just not like he does not have that speed and even a little bit of that length that Sasser did um, to defend. You yeah. know, the team's best yeah. player. Not, not easy guys to replace, right? Like, yeah. hey, oh, we need to replace a first round draft pick. We need to replace two well, <laughs> first round draft picks. Nah. Yeah, well, that's the question. Be in. Win in. Yeah. That's why I mean I think a lot of us Houston guys kind of roll our eyes whenever we see everyone say that. You know, so I, you're not replacing Sasser. I think it will be wrong. LJ Cryer is going to be a phenomenal player and do a lot of really special things this year, I think. But, uh, but you know, that's just not fair to him. Say, hey, you have to go be Marcus Sasser, who might be, by the way, one of the best rookies in the NBA this year. Yeah, boy, right. he's, he's <laughs> off, off to a tear, man. So, <laughs> Good for him. Um, you know, one, one thing I did want to point out about the the basketball game that I saw um, that that I you know, so talking about like the the defensive weakness maybe of this team. Uh, but also this might be one of the better interior defensive teams that we've had, or at least certainly the potential. When you look at uh, Javier Francis and Jojo Tugler's ability to okay. defend the rim and get blocked shots. Now we'll see how that, you know, continues to play out in the big 12, but you know, man, maybe, maybe it won't matter as much. Uh, the guys are getting beat by with, with how, uh, how well they've been able to defend the rim. Yeah. So, that was encouraging to see. It, it helps when you have between those two guys like 16 feet of arms, right? <laughs> uh, <laughs> to have all that arm length in the in, in you know in the front court there, uh, that's obviously uh, an advantage whenever you have to deal with guys that are taller. And it did look to me like Corpus Christi, um, AM Corpus Christi was a tall team, a long team. You know, they were a team that won their conference last year. They won the Southland Conference, and in the <laughs> last two years, they've been in the NCAA, NCAA tournament. So, you know this is a fairly good team, you know, even if they're, they're playing in the Southland conference, we got up to a pretty slow start in this game from what I noticed. Um, and part of that was, you know, and I don't know if this was a strategy of a Corpus Christi or not, but they seem to press and pressure uh, Jamal shed a, a lot early on. And mm -hmm. because of that, he got into uh, foul trouble early and he hardly played in the first half. I and mean, the guy had three rebounds 
rebounds, zero assists, and zero points in the first half. So they got to him. And for me, that's a that's a little bit of a concern, you know, because he is, you know, kind of for the more uh, for the most part, our uh, truest of point guards on the court. And we, we kind of go as, as he goes. Right. So if, if if teams can see that maybe they can get, you know, him in the early foul trouble, get him out of the game, then obviously that can be an advantage for an opposing team to come in. Uh, so I wasn't sure if that was like a game plan with with uh, the Islanders or not. But if it works because they got him out of the game and they, they disrupted his game and you could, you know, he, they got him a little flustered and frustrated at the, at the beginning, which I don't know if that's just you know, playing on this past, you know, Rob has mentioned before, you know, when talking about football and games pri- previously, like Sam Brown, a lot of these guys that play with passion, right. And, and, you know, shed plays with passion. Uh, mm-hmm. So, he, you know, he, I think it's something that to be, you know, keep a, a watch on as the season goes. The emotional leader, uh, so to speak. Exactly. Uh, but also free throw shooting. This is another oh. issue that we have with this team. And <laughs> we, we, we're going to have to fix that because we're going to see a lot of close games in the Big 12. And and you need to be able to you know put guys on the free throw line that can hit their shots. And it's just something that we need to fix. And I, I, it's just it's always been a problem for this school. Free throw shooting as far back as I can remember, you know, going back 30 years, it's always been a problem. And I just I don't know how you fix it. You know, I didn't even think uh, that far back. You're so right. That's awful. Um, always been a problem. Yeah, no, I mean, it's always you're, been a you're Kevin in his motivational speeches again. <laughs> no, that's <laughs> but, but I, I think you know it, it's certainly a problem of like a, a Kevin Sampson Houston team is is three point shooting and free throws, and you know the 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 three pointers are streaky, and you know I think a little bit of that like you look at like uh, L J Cryer in these first two games, and you have to wonder like is you know he's being asked to play harder on defense than he has historically. And it seems to me like that's kind of just wearing his legs down a little bit more than he's used to. And that's affecting his, his shot a little bit. I think as he gets a little bit more, you know, like you condition in the off season and all that. And don't worry, Alan Bishop is one of the best strengths coaches in the country, but you know, it takes a little bit to get that in game conditioning, uh, you know, in place. And so I I think uh, he gets a little more comfortable with that, gets settled in. Hopefully, Hopefully, hopefully that you know peaks back up. And same thing with Damian Dunn. I mean, they, didn't they say at one point Damian Dunn made like uh, you know twenty straight free throws or something last year? Then he went like over yeah. four to start the game. Uh, yeah. <laughs> from the free throw I think will come along. He talks some in the at media day about uh, even knowing you know. I think they knew uh, the the conversation with him coming in. Samson probably told him he was going to have to play better defense that that I mean uh, that was never a question his offense in terms of his shooting over at Baylor uh but he even mentioned when he came in at media day just how he knew it was going to be difficult and he knew that the conditioning was going to be tougher and it still took him by surprise even knowing like it still was even more than he expected so I think you're right in that as time goes on they get more into that end season uh condition uh, I think it'll be good. I think uh, his legs will improve, and I think the defense will improve as as they continue to work during the year. So, I mean, I don't know how how much room you can improve in season, but uh, I think conditioning wise, he'll continue to get up to speed, and so hopefully that you know takes a little bit of it uh, away in terms of his defensive struggles at times. Yeah. Now, one thing yeah, I, I want to oh, go ahead, Kevin. No, I was just going to say, you know, it, it was a thirty-two point win. You know, yeah, I don't uh, want you to make and, it sound negative. <laughs> you know, we're, we're, we're going to be the first to tell you about November team better. versus March team. Yeah, yeah, no, yeah. you know, um, but but you know, it, it, obviously, still some early concerns for the team, but I, I, you know, I think it's it's things that they can fix and work. Free throw shooting, I don't know. You know, I mean, uh, unless uh, Samson just have them, you know, you know, shooting a thousand free throws, you know, for practice, you know, every day to try to get that muscle memory in, you know, I don't know how you fix it, but you know, it's, it's something that you're going to have to fix. Right. Gatlin, I'm sorry. I didn't want to, yeah. what, what was your, what were no, you going to no, say? No, I, I was kind of, I was kind of moving along a little bit. I, I, I tend to agree with you. I mean, that's that, that was the one note that, that was kind of just deeply concerning, I mean, not deeply concerning, but like, you're right. It's a little harder to fix, right. Is we've always yeah. been a bad free throw shooting team. And I was kind of looking at this team before the season thinking, Hey, this might be one of our better free throw shooting team, just in terms of, how many playable guards we have who who are good shooters right and through two games it's not been yeah. you know it's not been great um so th- that is a concern for sure 
But uh, something I did want to kind of touch on that, that I made a note of was uh, um, this offense is, is interesting this year in that, you know, the, the replacement of Tremont Mark with uh, um, Emmanuel Sharp in how it spaces the floor. And I think, you know, there's still like the offense has looked kind of clunky these first two games. I mean, as clunky as it can be when you're scoring 80 points a game. Right. But, but, uh, but, but in the half court offense, it's, it looks a lot more like an NBA offense in terms of like that floor spacing, high ball screen penetration and kick, like um, whenever they're not running sets. And, uh, and so I, I think it I think it has some really exciting opportunity um, if these guys can make shots. I mean, what were we? I think it was in the first half, like two for eleven from three or something like that. Yeah, it was rough out of the gate for sure. The early part that I saw was rough. It was pretty bad. Yeah, but it cleaned up a lot after after I stopped watching. They got better, so I'll take full credit. <laughs> yeah, um, you know, and and, and I, I I love watching uh, Terrence Arsenault. Um, you know, I I think. Uh, He's kind of had uh, the unfortunate luck of, you know, kind of being built into this, you know, draft prospect and everybody talking about, you know, that, that it kind of uh, creates some unrealistic expectations. Um, yeah. But I don't know. I mean, when I watched him, I see a guy who is versatile, can play uh, three or four. I mean, that the, the ability for Houston to go small ball with him, I think is going to be really exciting this year as they, uh, get into some some of these mismatches. Like I'd love to see against Kansas. You know, Hunter Dickinson's mm-hmm. having a big game, and they just go small ball and like you know full NBA style, right? Like just take right. him out of the game on on the other end, right? Like that kind of thing. Um, but his ability to play defense on the perimeter, guard two, three, maybe even four positions on the court, mm-hmm. and you know, I, I think they'll figure out how to get him into some offensive looks that suit him a little bit better, like. He, he reminds me a little bit of that Tremont Mark in terms of like you watched the few opportunities he had, like when he just got to get the ball in his hands and go play basketball, he looked pretty good. He got to the rim a couple times, some had a nice finish, like, um, but you know, he's he's just not an offensive threat at this point. Um, and, and I think right. they need to figure out where he kind of fits into that. Well, he's he's got all the talent in the world. You know, he he he's got exactly what you want in a basketball player, right? Just he he just I, I think that's what the the scouts and and the experts keep saying is that he just needs to bring it all together, right? Um, in in, in the uh, you know as as a professional athlete as opposed to someone who's just crossing over from from high school to college hoping to get to the NBA, uh, to just put it all together. But I yeah I agree with you. You know he he just he does seem to be lost a little bit on the team. Uh, but I, I, you know, I'm pretty sure that, that they'll figure things out. You know, that, that, that's why they play these first two months to prepare for conference, right. Is to, uh, figure out how to best use these guys. Um, and you know, we know the schedule is going to get a lot harder, you know, as, as we go into the season, but you know, one of the things that this team does have working for it is its depth. Uh, you know, mm-hmm. whenever you have somebody who has, is having, having an off shooting night, like, like, um, uh, who was it that had one last night? Uh, Sharp. Man, Sharp was having Sharp. an off night last yeah. night. Yeah. You know, uh, and, but, you know, other players on the team, they they pick up the slack for him. You know, he, he had a great first game, but the second game wasn't all that good. Same with Cryer, right? Uh, so you just, you it, it, any, at any night, it's any of the other players can can pick up the other players. And, and I think that's what, you know, works well with this team. And that's why this team is successful is because we're not just playing six or seven guys. You know, we're playing 10 guys. Uh, deep on the bench with, with meaningful right. minutes. Yeah. 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 I mean, that, that was the, that was the, the biggest knock on that uh, team that went to the elite eight with Carlton and uh, Kyler, like they it just ran out of bodies. Uh, yeah. It felt like every yeah. game you'd, you know, they, they'd blow a team open and then, you know, you kind of start to see them creep back in at the end. Cause they just, you know, the, the, their legs ran out. Right. And I think, you know, that's a little yeah. bit of what happened. Ultimately, in that Villanova game, you went two for thirty from three. Your legs right. just ran out, and you didn't have any depth. And and here, like that's a really great point, Kevin. I look, and you know, LJ, you have a lot of guys who can make shots, and that's not historically been. You've had teams with great shooters or great scorers, but it's been one or two guys. Right. And when those guys right. are off, you you know, it's going to be a rough it's night. The James Harden rule, basically. 
Yeah. And in this team, you look at like all the way down from LJ Cryer and Mark and Jamal Shedd, who can even, you know, he can get hot at times and start hitting a yeah. couple threes. Uh, all the way down, you know, coming off the bench, Damian Dunn is a just certified bucket. You know, yeah. even even Ramon Walker is starting to look back like he did his freshman year yeah, uh, yeah. for two games. You know, uh, if he can, you know, create some spacing and hit some shots for us, like the the amount of guys <laughs> who can go get buckets, um, I think is something that, that this team hasn't had in a while. And yeah, and deep, deepest in a while in terms of that, I would agree, uh, in terms of scoring options. And that yeah. should play dividends down the road if you lose somebody for a few games injury, or like you said, if a guy or two is having a bad night, you just you can switch them out, and and those those players get that. So uh, Kelvin's very uh, honest with his guys, uh, so I think that you know what I mean. They, they understand the bigger the bigger uh, picture, so to speak. Yeah. yeah. And and I do think yeah. you know going, going back to again, just kind of one one last point I had. Uh, that I, I thought was going to be interesting to, to see how this plays out. You know, one of the challenges of these Kel- Kelvin Sampson offenses is whenever you're not getting turnovers on the defensive end, the ball sticks, right? Yeah. And we saw that in the first half of this game. Um, and one of the things I think they can do <laughs> is when they go with that small ball lineup and you get Terrence Arsenault in there, um, you now have four round one. It creates a lot more space. Uh, for you know some of these guys that we're talking about, like a Damian Dunn or Jamal Shedd, to kind of get some penetration and just go one on one, right, and get a couple buckets um, until you're able to ratchet things up on the defensive end. Because you know those turnovers are going to come, right. um, but Houston has always infamously you hit those streaks where you just you know teams are making tough shots and and turnovers aren't coming, yeah. and you need to be able to just kind of go get a bucket and create and I, it. Right. Yeah. And I think being able to go small and create more spacing um, will help Houston to be able to do that. Cause you saw last night, like teams go to these two, three zones or, you know, something like that, or, or they just kind of compact the lane and, uh, and, and put pressure on, on the point guard and there's just nowhere to go with the ball. And so, uh, you know, I think having, having a fourth guard in that lineup um, might create some interesting opportunities uh, when that happens. So. Yeah, and and luckily they're early in the season where they can you know play with those uh, lineups uh, and and see what's going to work best in in certain situations, right? Um, you know we, we haven't hit the, uh, the 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 meat of the schedule yet, so Samson has some time to play around with lineups and and see just how the guys are going to react whenever they're playing with uh, with each other. So it's it, it again early season problems. You know we have time to get these fixed. Um, get times to, you know, work through some things, uh, you know, because we, look, we have new players, right? So you have to see what the new players can, you know, how they're going to uh, play and, and mesh with the uh, the players that have been here. But, you know, early in the season, these are early season problems. You know, if we're still talking about these problems in January or February, then it's a concern, mm-hmm. right? But, you know, I I think we all have faith in, in Coach Samson and his staff that, you know, they, they'll at least get a lot of this stuff cleaned up to the point where, you know, we're, we're going to be competitive and 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 do well for the most part in most of the games that we play in. But, you know, a slow start the first two games is is a little concerning. But, you know, again, early in the season, we're still winning by 30 points. So it's it, it's tough to be concerned, right? Um, yeah. yeah, yeah, and and uh, yeah. I, I think you're right. I mean, if, if, if it continues, you know, I mean, this is what you expect the first two games of the season, right? Yeah. Especially with so many new players on the roster. Like, it, you know, it didn't take time. Yeah, yeah. It, if we if we won these games by five or ten, then it's a concern, right? But if right. if we're having these problems, we're still winning by thirty. I mean, look, we should have won by forty last night, but free throw shooting was off, uh, and that's not even hitting all your free throws. You know, we had fifty two percent or something like that from from the free throw line. So you win by forty if you hit your free throw. So we're we're nitpicking a little bit here, but you know, if again, if these if these are still problems, you know, two months from now, then. Sure. A real problem, right? But well, and, and, you know, we're, we're, I, we're, we're just poking the bear at this point. Yeah, well, no, and, and and again, I you know, like I said, it's it's pretty common for some of these Kelvin Sampson teams, especially whenever yeah. you lose several starters. Like I, again, I, I mentioned that I guess it was 2021 team with Carlton and Kyler Edwards. Uh, their for, was it was at their first game of the season that was that uh, you know two point overtime oh, yeah. win versus you know 
uh, St. Joe's School for the Blind, right? Uh, whoever that was. Yeah. <laughs> they, they actually ended up being okay that year. Yeah. Correctly, they were they were almost in the tourney um, that year, yeah. but but you know certainly a, a game that you expect to win, you know, handedly. Yeah. But you know those early games, it's just uh, you know you never know. Yeah. So well, speaking know, I, of early I, games in in the the easy schedule out of the gate, uh, they they welcome Stetson into Fertitta Center Monday night. Yeah. Uh, you know that's going to be more the same. Yeah, Monday night. Yeah, Monday night. Um, so that'll be the next one up. Uh, I believe I'll be over there. Uh, and that'll be game two for me this year. I know you guys are waiting in the wings. Uh, Gatlin's out of town, but you'll probably be uh, coming up soon in terms of being there in person. So uh, I know you're looking forward to that, getting a chance to actually see it in person too. So uh, I'm sure that'll happen soon. After Stetson Monday, what they go off on the uh, Charleston leg of the three games in a few days type thing. Uh, let's uh, see. We'll Looks like it. Yeah. Back in, when they get back in town. Yeah. Games Thursday and Friday. Yeah. And the A&M thing at uh, for, or for Tita at uh, same different tra- at, at, at the Rockets place. Uh, yeah. yeah, that's the one I was thinking of. Uh, at Fertitta's other, at the yeah, other stadium, Fertitta's other, other Fertitta Center. <laughs> <laughs> Can we just name these both Fertitta Center and cut to the chase, yeah. please? <laughs> uh, but yeah, that's coming up not too far away too. So yeah, hoops. Yeah. All hoops right, so here. this might be a this might be a good time to uh, go ahead and segue into the uh, University of Houston versus Cincinnati game last night that we uh, we witnessed that we partook in. Um, yeah. Glad to you know, look, look, that. I, we, we all realize, you know, what this team is right now. Okay. So I don't think last night, well, I, I think it was surprising that we lost and we played the way that we did. Um, was it really surprising at the same time? You know what I mean? Um, but it's a tough loss. Cincinnati's lost seven straight. They were not looking good, really doing it. We knew they had a good run game after talking with Keegan last week. Uh, and I, I thought it was going to be a run heavy game also, you know, going into the preview and, and we had a pretty good running game, 139 yards, I think on the ground, uh, but not much in the air. Uh, I think Donovan was probably right at about 50% on his throws, 200 and some change with a couple touchdowns and a couple picks. Uh, just again, just not a good night offensively for this team. Um, and the, you know, I, I give the defense credit for keeping us in the game as much as they were on the field. And I, I don't fault the defense at all for how the game turned out. You know, it was, it was the defense, uh, it was the defense, yeah. uh, it was Charlie, it was the offense giving the ball up three and outs, just not getting anything going on the, uh, offensive side that, that kept the defense on the field. So it was a, it was a tough game to watch last night. Yeah, that's true. And then when they lost dot as well, that didn't help in terms of the middle yeah. of, the, of the defense. That's, I mean. They're already down a body, too, with Ossie gone, which I don't think he was playing a ton anyway. But uh, in terms of your bodies, and you talk about how the, the depth and the rotation there. But, yeah, when Dot went back down again, uh, yeah, you know what I mean? That That's that's a big impact player in the middle of the line. So yeah. uh, that didn't help their run defense any at all, in my opinion. And, and uh, we'll see if he even makes it back this year, not in terms of uh, how long it's going to take for that ankle to heal up. But. You know what I mean? We talked about that before we came on air. I don't know how necessary it is for him to be out there. That'll come down to him. You know, I'm, as a player, I'm sure he wants to be out there. And, and I think his frustration yeah. showed when he got hurt the other night. But uh, you know how it goes. Well, you know, Cal- Caldwell had a good game. Cal- he Caldwell did. Had Jamar, good game. I tell you no. what, he's coming on, man. He really is. I wouldn't yeah. be shocked to see. I want to say I have to go back. I'm pretty sure he should be in long enough. He might. He might. Be one of those guys that tests the waters and sees what sees what he can get back in terms of a draft grade this offseason. Uh yeah. just because I think he has a real high ceiling and those those scouts are gonna see that. You know what I mean? The same stuff that Brian early drooled about uh when he went and found the kid at the at Independence Community College. Uh yeah, I believe yeah, he was over at Indy after Hutch. Yeah. yeah. I, I went back and re-listened to, by the way. I don't want to jump off from the left field, but Jamar, I went back and listened to uh, interview I did with him right after he committed. I'm gonna uh, probably type some notes up from it, but he talked a lot about his history and moving around a lot and how he got to Houston in the first place. So, uh, yeah. just tremendous athlete for a kid his size, and, and just seeing him doing some of the stuff he was doing last night again, uh, he's just explosive. And and uh, to segue to the other explosive side, 
uh, with the offense and the struggles last night. I think a lot of it had to do with the struggles up front again. The offensive line continued to struggle a bit. Uh, Don Corleone in the middle for Cincinnati. We talked about it with Keegan last week, uh, Kevin. Uh, he was I as advertised. Yeah. Early on, man, yeah, he really would. disrupted. First couple series, he was pretty disruptive in there with in the middle of the line. Uh, and so he kind of stuck around. He was – he settled down a little bit as it went, but he for sure uh, put his stamp on the game last night. Yeah, they tried to yeah. to get away from – they tried to scheme him out a little bit later. He did more of that yeah. guard tackle pool where you're basically on him off. And, you know, Corleone was phenomenal, but he's not fast enough to go chase that thing down from the from the backside. Right. Um, right. <laughs> but, but, uh, but, yeah, early on and when they tried to run it at him, I mean, that dude was a wall in the middle. Um, you know, the defensive line did some good things too. Uh, you know, you're right. The, the offensive line looked horrible. Um, I, I was watching, I mean, Unige, uh, you know, there, there was a, a play in my mind where they pulled the uh, the the defensive end from, the, from Pat Paul's side on a, like, delayed stunt. And he came all the way around and ran right by Unige and like almost, you know, got a sack on Donnie. It's like, I mean, the, the, the fundamentals, man, are just so poor across the offensive line. Um, yeah. They're, they're overreaching. They're not having good pad level, immobile, unflexible hips. They, you know, like no strength in their hands. They're not punching. It, it's just painful to watch. Yeah, point. it's tough. I think it's it's in a weird spot, and this is one of those longer term discussions. But it's in a weird spot, you know what I mean? The first year offensive line coach, so you know he's got some of his guys in there, so to speak, but not all. Uh, some yeah. of the stuff he's taught in one off season versus you know as time would progress with the players over time. So I mean, it's not you can't really just put it on one guy per se, but uh, as a whole, in year five, as I've become famous for saying the last handful of episodes in year five it's uh you know it, we know where it's going to land at so yeah and and you know I, I mean look i don't think we need to beat a dead horse too much on on this thing i think we all kind of you know typically i i would pull up some some video to to talk through here but um usually i do that in order to add you know insight and nuance to hey you know some of these things aren't as bad as they look or you know here's what was happening here's why they beat us and I don't think it's really necessary because it was yeah. as, as it looked. Um, yeah. <laughs> we got outcoached, outplayed. Just push play on the, on the game in general, and you'll see it. Yeah, yeah. Out, outcoached, outplayed, out hustled, <laughs> out blocked, out ran, out tackled, out footballed um, from whistle to whistle. At no point did it look like Houston was in control of this game. Um, you know, the 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 biggest frustration to me, and, and this is all I'll share X's and O's wise, um, was watching. You know, again, everyone wants to to kill the game plan and all that. The the play calls were fine. Could you have done more? Absolutely. Uh, you could. I, I would have liked to see. This would have actually been a good game. I think for you know those people who are asking for the jet sweeps, uh, tunnel screens, the kind of outside runs. Uh, the reason uh, is because Cincinnati is running a lot of cover three. So what that means is you have one high safety. And two cornerbacks who, as soon as the ball is snapped, they're kind of turning and running to get to depth. So that vacates right. a lot of space on the outside. That creates opportunity to get the ball to your playmakers in space. Um, we tried to do that a couple times and missed some blocks. Uh, Joseph Manjack, specifically, one comes to mind, uh, things like that. But I, I would have liked to see more, more of that. Um, but in the passing game, the way you beat cover three is you take shots uh, down the seams, uh, you know, in between the the three safeties, didn't really do that too much. Um, and when we did, it was it was covered. And uh, and you dink and dunk your way down the field, out routes, uh, crossing routes. Uh, you know, into quick developing hitches, right? Uh, you know, things in that space on the outside. And we called those plays. Balls were late. Balls were off target. And wide receivers weren't winning yeah. matchups. I think I think yeah. the the play to me that like highlighted everything was the uh, it was like third and five I think 
and we had uh, Sam Brown had that drag route over the middle. He ran. It was like you know two or three yards of depth, and the dude like body slammed him to the ground. He's like, I'm I'm sorry. If if you're you're the the leader in the Big Twelve in passing or in uh, receiving yards, you gotta win that matchup. You you yeah. gotta outrun him. You gotta be faster. That's the coaching point. Be better. Yeah. You know and, that's little uh, things like that too. People are picking up on that are starting to wonder more. Yeah. You know, is this team running out of gas, so to speak, as this year's coming to a, a close and the losses are mounting, so to speak. Are there people that are starting to get frustrated and let it affect their, their play and all that? So uh, it's right. just one of those tough situations. It's not going to fix itself in, for another couple games. And Well, you know, you know it, I mean? it was funny. Uh, one of the things Dana said in his post-game press conference, because I think someone asked about, uh, you know, how, how bad does it feel, you know, missing uh, Matt Golden? What does that do to your offense? Blah, blah, blah. And Dana, you know, his response was, uh, you know, I believe we have eight other uh, wide receivers on scholarship. on scholarship. Where were they? Yeah. That's the question I want to ask. And and I thought to myself, no, no, no. That's the question I want to ask. You're the one who's yeah. supposed to have the answer to that question. You coached right? wide receivers before you were, were a coordinator. You tell me where the receiver's at. Why are they not developing? That's, that's yeah. what you get paid to do. <laughs> you know, you know I, I made some notes about that. You know, Gatlin, what, what you're talking about. It was the, towards the end of the third quarter, and I wrote this on Houston offense. I said, I wrote, is it that the OL cannot hold the pass rush long enough? Okay, that was one thing that I wrote. Or, or is it that the QB is holding the ball too long? Or is it the wide receiver's inability to get open? And apparently it's all three, right? You um, have about to say yes, so, all, yes, so, yes, and so, yes. So, but so, unfortunately, it's at like different so. times and yeah, go ahead, Gatlin. I know what you're about to say. No, no, no. Exactly. So, 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 yeah, so, so you're right. Like, does the offensive line need to improve significantly? Sure. For sure. But this is a game where when I, I was thinking about it beforehand, I actually wasn't too concerned because I'm like, okay, great. The the way you beat this cover is actually three, like, this, Yeah, this is actually good. It's going to be a lot of quick game, quick passes to the outside, get our guys in space, and <laughs> we just weren't able to execute that. And Donovan holding the ball too long and, you know, waiting for, you know, deep developing routes that are probably your second or third read. Or if it is a primary, it's like you're supposed to look at it. If it's not there, go. If it ain't there, move, yeah. And, and he's just holding on too long. And, and then it highlights, okay, now, yeah, the offensive line is there and, and they're not holding up. And, you know, but, but that's a secondary issue to what yeah. you said, Kevin, which are the primary issues. Wide receivers not winning matchups. And when they do, we're not getting accurate balls. Yeah, right. Exactly and right. I, I was noticing that, like a, a receiver is open for a split second, the ball's late, and that allows the uh, that allows time for the defender to get there to defend it. And that's what I was I noticing. A lot of the short, yeah, a lot of these short passes, the balls balls not there. Yeah, uh, the exactly. Were there at the same time, the ball was. was. Exactly. The, the, the receiver was open before that, but Smith just was not getting the ball to the receiver in that We're in seeing that time like that a, a receiver to. run a five-yard hitch and turn around and stand there and dance yeah. for a couple seconds while he waits for the ball. I mean, every, you know what I mean? By then, everybody else knows you're open and there's already people moving that direction. And so – and, he, and exactly. Then the, exactly. The late ball, like the one that didn't matter, but the, the one that went off of the helmet for – that popped up in the air for the interception that was more of a oh, yeah. well that's the, there you go that's there you go that's the game right that that's a good uh, explanation for the game in one play and I know in the post game yeah. Holgerson complained when he brought up the other scholarship wide receivers he said you know we have people we have interceptions popping off people's helmet and I agree that's silly uh but the reason it went off his helmet is because the pass was such a poorly thrown pass he had to go to the ground for it and he misjudged it as he was diving for the ball. I mean, it wouldn't have mattered if he did catch it. I mean, I'm, of course, you know what I mean. At that point, it didn't matter anymore. But again, you're 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 complaining about it, and I get what you're saying. Just it wasn't going to change anything anyway. And if it were a better ball that he wasn't diving on the ground to catch it, probably wouldn't hit his helmet. Right. Well, and, and we, look, we and ran five plays. plays. And, we ran. Sorry, we just what, we ran five plays in the third was. quarter. That's it. That's we ran crazy. five plays in the third quarter. Five plays in the third quarter. I wrote that down. <laughs> five plays. That's it. And it's funny because they said earlier in the broadcast too. When I went back and watched the broadcast, <laughs> part, 
Yeah, I know, Gatlin right? is speechless right now. <laughs> yeah, Gatlin. <laughs> 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 He's processing it. He's processing <laughs> five plays. Like, how, how do you get only five plays in an entire quarter? We did it. But, we did. They did touch on it, though, in the broadcast early on. They they brought up in their conversation with Holgerson during the week that he had shared he was concerned about possessions because they, mm-hmm. they showed him early on, and he was uh, on the sideline and crouching down and concerned and watching the offense. And they said, you know, this is one of those games he's worried about possessions. And, and it came to be true just because how much Cincinnati runs the football. Uh, yeah, they, yeah. they greatly limited the number of possessions Houston got. Yeah, so that's certainly Cincinnati's game plan, right, is, hey, we're going to make this game short and, you know, try to to run the ball, control the clock. And, you know, and then defensively, like I said, they're playing cover three, which is designed to take away deep shots over the top, you know, big plays, right? And so that's kind of the idea is they right. want to slow the game down and they want to make you slow the game down and take these, you know, slow developing, you know, drives as well. Right. Um, but, you know, something – and again, I mean, look – we know this isn't going to fix anything, but like just a, a gripe I have as I listen to uh, Dana talk about, uh, you know, his, his uh, pregame press conferences uh, for the week. He, he, you know, he said that, right. He said, Hey, this is going to be a slug fest. It's going to be a, uh, you know, quick game with not a lot of possessions and uh, you know, Hey, we could lose to these guys. They're really good. You know, they won a lot of football games over the last couple of years. Drives me crazy. I like over the years, like playing, being around coaching, when coaches say, and I'm sure this was said at halftime, I guarantee you, if you guys don't get your act together, you're going to lose this effing game. I guarantee you those words came out of Dana's mouth. And guess what? When you say that to kids enough, they start to believe you. And, and I feel like that's what's happened at points in this season is you say, guys, this is a good football team. We gotta, we gotta bring our A game, or we're gonna lose. Guess what? <laughs> yeah. It's gonna well, like. Why would you put that out there? It's I, I, prophetic. I, yeah. 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 And and, Maybe and that's the, it. Just feels like that's kind of the mentality of of this team at this point. Is like we're we're on our heels. There's nothing about what what you see that is like an identity or who or, or that this is even what we want to be doing offensively or defensively, right? It just feels desperate. Yeah. Very true. I, I don't know. I, I only, 100% agree. Only two games left in the season. Obviously, Oklahoma State comes to uh, TDECU next Saturday. What, we get 3, 3 p.m. kickoff, I believe? 3 o'clock. finally yeah. announced yesterday. Yeah, 3 o'clock kickoff. That'll be senior night. Uh, you know, good for them. I think it's obviously good that those guys are there for that. Uh, and everyone, you know, try to come out and support the seniors. Remember, it's their last game. Um, basketball, we already touched on. It's got Stetson Monday, and then they'll go off to Charleston. Anything else we're, we haven't touched on, at least for this episode? Anything else, Kevin, well, you wanted to talk about? Well, I mean, there's things that I want to talk about, but maybe we'll wait and talk about it after Saturday's Next game. episode. You know, because I think uh, we, I know a lot of I, people I, want to. I have, we'll have more to talk about. Yeah, we'll have more to talk yeah. about it. I think. <laughs> yeah, that's just sure. my opinion. I think that's fair. We'll people want to know about more about. Yeah, and we've been talking on the boards a lot about coaching and this and that. That that let's give it till after Saturday and let's let's talk again. Uh, I'll be probably willing to talk even more and speculate more if it comes to that in terms of after next week's game. So. Maybe even we'll see uh, when we get ready to record the preview show for Oklahoma State this week. Uh, might have some more info as well, and if so, I'll pass it along. But for sure, any t- anything we get on any of these situations will come. Uh, it'll be on the board as well. So for all those that are already on the board, uh, y'all will see it there first probably. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Episode 14. Like, subscribe, share. <laughs> Email Comment there. below. Link so she can watch it. <laughs> All those things. What watch what, watch this episode over and over again. You don't even have to like be there. Just watch it. Yeah. Put <laughs> it on in the background. <laughs> Just loop it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I could have swore right. I think the first show. 500 was probably abuse was probably me, you know, just going back and watching it over and over and over again. So yeah. <laughs> you went back and watched the opening over and over again. I know you did. <laughs> if i'm not mistaken too before we shut it down i think uh, i remember digging pictures out for that I, I know 
I think DJ was in that that group of pictures I sent you, and I want to say Zach too. I bet probably not Ralph or Jeffrey, but uh, awesome. Yeah, I, yeah. I would bet. And and so yeah, I'm gonna go back do some more photos and create something, and I'll put some more stuff on uh, just mem- mem- in memoriam, so to speak. I'll put together something just for my time getting to cover them and all that. So yeah. anything else before we go? Fifty four minutes, man. Mm-hmm. I think I'm I'm done, uh, you know, complaining and getting all of this stress out, you know. This too shall pass. Basketball will improve as it goes. Football will work its way out the way it's supposed to work its way out in the next couple of weeks. They they say the the opposite of love is not hate, but apathy. Mm, (laughs) See, (laughs) that's that's the type of language we've got to leave on right there. That's it. That's a fitting fitting description of where we're at. (laughs) That's a good point, though. All right. Well, you guys know the routine. Like, subscribe, all that good stuff, and uh, see us on the site if you don't already. Yeah. Thanks. Stay close to the board, obviously, for news coming up, uh, recruiting and athletic news. Uh, oh, you know, yeah. look, this time of year, a lot of things start to, to get into motion. So you, you definitely want to stay close to uh, what's happening, you know. And, and, and Falls uh, 2024 so offensive know, lineman. Yeah. Samir Camacho was at the game last night. Uh, and uh, some other guys, well, JT. Kitna was there. I talked to him for a few minutes and all that. Uh, Jacaden Ferguson. We'll put more uh, from visitors on the board. I'm going to do that next. Actually, we're doing recording. Uh, I'm going to put that up tonight. So Sunday night, check the board. We'll have visitors list up, and I'll begin following up with some of these 24 guys. Yeah, uh, Rob. Uh, yeah, uh, speaking on that, before we go, I mean, we are getting to the end of the high school football season, uh, regular yeah. season at least for right now. You know, yeah, uh, playoffs are going. What's now, next yeah. whenever it comes to what, what's next whenever it comes to recruiting as far as the process goes? Now that the basically um, the, the season is over, it'll be now for high schoolers. There may be some official vid- visitors. Caleb Thomas, uh, the North Shore tight end, okay. was on his official visit this past weekend because he didn't take one in the summer. So he was actually okay. in on an official visit. Um, but there'll be some more official visitors coming from JUCO as well as uh, some late qualifying and late uh, offered high schoolers. I know there's a defensive end I'm looking at from um, – I'm losing it off the top of my head. Uh, it's a defensive end that's, uh, I want to say, from the Metroplex area. What's that? Oh, sorry. I said, was it the one from Hutchinson? I know there was a guy – uh, oh no! Um, he oh, it's a uh, it's a kid from Lake Ridge. So uh, defensive end. He, he had a uh, he's a a, a guy that played basketball. It's his first year playing football. He's playing defensive end. Kind of no one even knew who he was in September. He got Houston Tech and UTSA offers all come through because of his oh. early film of the season. And so oh. that's a, a guy they're they're chasing a little bit more. It's a twenty four defensive end, and he's one of those. Like former basketball players, like a couple guys that have had success here at Houston lately on the defensive line of had. So Ryan early special. Uh, yeah, there you go, right? And so he's big, big kid. I want to say 6'5", 230, you know, long 35 nice reach type deal, yeah. one of those long, long lanky, typical former basketball player. So yep. yeah, we'll look on the board. We'll have some more on that. I'll have his name and other stuff all coming up on the board tonight. And those are some of the 24 guys will be who we follow up with first. Uh, we'll see how the next couple of weeks go. And then everything will uh, advance really quickly in the month of December because you're going to have the portal open on the second. You're going to have early signing period on the 20, wow. late 20s, 22nd. It'll be a real crazy December. And, and that's just the recruiting end of it. There's no telling. We could, if we're in a coaching search, it'll be crazy as well. So. Well, and stay this, tuned. It's about to get fun, uh, and uh, you're going to want to be around for this one. It'll be uh, it'll be fast, but it'll be we'll do a good job of covering it. Well, especially, uh, you know, I, I think it was mentioned a little bit on the board, kind of in jest, but uh, with Jimbo leaving, probably one of the most talent rich rosters in America is going to have a see day some window the portal. and a portal. So you will see it's a lot true. of these probably jump in there, and uh, maybe, maybe you should could capitalize there. Yeah, they've got a really not, good offensive line up there. Well, not to mention, I mean, there are some kids in that twenty-four class currently committed. I think of uh, Cole Eccles and oh, uh, some guys Evan like who are Stewart. kids. Who yeah. you know, I, I don't know that Houston's been in on them up to this point at all. But you know, this might be a, a decent opportunity to try and get in there late on some of those guys as well. Yeah, I agree. Yeah. All right, guys, I appreciate it as always, man. Uh, 
and we will see you guys for episode 15 next. We'll be previewing Oak State, talking more hoops, and uh, whatever else comes up between now and then. Yeah. All right. Thanks, Thanks Rob. Thanks, Gatlin.